I'd like to talk today about machine emotional intelligence. That is the capacity for humans to perceive and understand or excuse me, emotion. Uh, over the past few years, the SEI has been building a portfolio of these uh, passive biometrics te technologies uh, towards this goal of machine emotional intelligence. In 2016, we combined technology from uh, MIT CSAIL and Scilab right here at CMU to demonstrate real-time heart rate extraction using only uh, an off-the-shelf web camera. And in 2017, we investigated the feasibility of facial microexpression analysis for emotion recognition. Um, you can think of facial microexpressions as uh, poker tells like this guy here. He has a flush, he's pretty happy, but these are the involuntary fleeting expressions that uh, appear on someone's face. Separate from this work, Professor Rita Singh at CMU's Language Technologies Institute has been uh, researching voice forensics. A few years ago, the US Coast Guard was inundated with hoax mayday calls. These were expensive to respond to and potentially dangerous as well because they distract uh, from actual emergencies. And they, the Coast Guard approached Professor Singh asking for help. So she was able to analyze short, noisy clips like this one. I guess it's not playing. Uh, it's, it's a short, very noisy clip of someone saying mayday. It's only a few seconds long. She had only a, a short collection of these clips, but was able to come up with a whole profile of this hoax caller. She was able to tell what his upbringing was, his stress levels, his age, his weight, what kind of room he was broadcasting from. Really remarkable stuff. And so two years ago, we set out to collaborate with Professor Singh and see if we could apply some of her voice processing research to emotion recognition. Now, I think an explanation of why all this works really begins with an explanation of the human voice. Your voice is a, a complex physical and cognitive process. You are pumping air through your lungs. You are varying the tension in your vocal folds. You are changing the shape of your vocal cavity with your tongue, with your jaw. You're expelling a time-varying pressure wave between 50 and 7,000 hertz. And every step along the way, your voice production is being affected by factors like how awake you are, your energy level, your hormones, your stress levels, et cetera. And so we can analyze all these biomarkers with what Professor Singh calls microarticulometry. Uh, this is built on decades of research into speech recognition here at CMU. And the core idea of microarticulometry is that you're breaking voice down into its constituent components and analyzing each of these building blocks for fine-grained voice features. This is more robust than uh, a lot of uh, other approaches that only analyze voice on a broad scale. So some of the applications of this technology are, ob are obvious, things like uh, security checkpoints or intelligence profiling. The one I'm most excited about, though, is human-machine teaming. This is the, um, uh, the idea of, of humans and AI systems working closely together. Just as it's important for humans to be able to trust and understand the AI systems that we're working with, it's going to be important for those systems, uh, those machines, to understand, to perceive, to react to their human counterparts. So I don't have time to go into every element of our research today, but I want to call it attention to what I think are the two key contributions. The first is the creation of a novel speech emotion database. And the second is a new set of voice processing techniques and machine learning models that act on that data set. So why create a new database. It turns out a lot of the current generation of data sets for speech emotion recognition are rather limited in some ways. Uh, first off, they're small, which is not very good if you want to do machine learning. They're also very controlled and sanitized in ways that are not conducive for uh, real world applications. Uh, the speakers are often actors rather than uh, people uh, speaking extemporaneously. Uh, and these 
recordings are often made in environments that are very clean. There's, there's very low noise. If we want to work in the wild, we need in the wild data. So that's what we set out to do. And we set out to create a database that was an order of magnitude larger than what was currently out there. So we collected over 54 hours of audio recordings from podcasts, from radio, from television interviews. And we filtered, we segmented out this data to create tens of thousands of audio clips. And then we gave it to crowdsourcing, uh, or excuse me, to crowds via crowdsourcing uh, with Amazon's Mechanical Turk web service. Uh, and use that to collect labels for all of our data. So each human labeler was given an interactive face like this. This is called an affect button. And we were, we were telling them to select the face that best matched the recording that they were listening to. This mapped to a space called the, the VAD model. VAD stands for valence, arousal, and dominance. This is a, a popular representation of emotion in psychology. Um, and it's useful to us because it gives you a numerical model that's much richer in the representation of emotion uh, as compared to uh, a handful of discrete labels that you might have. So each face maps to some point in this three-dimensional space. And then we put each recording in front of several listeners so we could actually collect statistics on everything we were doing. So at the end of this year, we're going to be publishing the largest ever in the wild speech emotion database. It has over 29,000 annotated audio clips, 324,000 annotations. And in addition to that, we're going to be releasing the tools that we use to develop this database. The idea there is that the work is not going to end with what we did over the past two years. Other groups are going to be able to pick this up and augment our work. Now, uh, Professor Singh was supposed to be here today, but she couldn't make it. Uh, and so to talk about some of the work on the uh, voice processing models and machine learning models that we built uh, is her student, Shahan Ali Maman. Shahan's been instrumental in a lot of this research, and so I'm privileged to share the stage with him. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm Shahan, and I am very nervous. <laughs> and you will be able to tell that from my voice. Um, turns out that uh, we make judgments about other people's states and traits um, all the time from their voice. Um, and this leads to conclusions such as, he sounded old, or he sounded really angry on the phone, and so on. This is called perception. And humans' ability to perceive different emotions uh, is extremely sophisticated. The study of how humans perceive emotions, uh, perceive different sounds, is what we call um, auditory perception. This is different um, from articulometry, which is the study of how different measurements of the movements and the positions of the uh, artic articulators affect the production of the sound. A speaker's emotional state uh, affects uh, his or her physiology. Uh, such as the tension in the muscles, um, or the rapid breathing, um, or the velocity of the articulators. This, in turn, affects the fine level uh, details in the voice, such as the voice quality or the pitch. These details can be characterized in terms of feature representations, which can then be deduced uh, to figure out emotions, um, such as if the person is angry or if the person is sad or any of the six universal emotions by Paul Ekman. But why stop at six emotions only? Why not eight emotions? Why not a whole spectrum of emotions as shown uh, by the Plutchik's wheel? The thing is that humans uh, demonstrate complex emotional states. And so if you're sort of discretizing emotions such as this, you're sort of limiting the power of expression as well as perception. And so. Um, there is this very famous model in the speech community, which is called the emotion primitives, or the valence activation dominance model, which is what we use uh, in our study. Uh, where we, what we basically do is we project emotions on a 3D continuous space, uh, such that you can capture the nuances um, that are in the emotional states. As discussed, uh, we use effect button as a proxy to capture uh, these uh, continuous um, emotions. 
Um, we use data from the wild, um, as well as uh, mechanical turkers as our annotators. Um, there are certain limitations with this kind of data uh, in terms of noise specifically. And this noise comes both in terms of utterances as well as in terms of the annotations. And so we use proper resampling and filtering strategies to figure out how we can prune out both those utterances as well as those uh, annotations. But that's not interesting. What's interesting is how we model this whole problem. And so in our first model, we use what we call speaker-specific embeddings. And the idea here is very simple, uh, which is that in most of the models that are out there, uh, people make a very simplifying assumption about the universality of emotions. They assume that the way I express emotions is the way Oren would express emotions, and the way everyone would express emotions. And same goes for perception, which is not a true assumption uh, in essence, uh, because different people express emotions differently. So I personally have an emotional range of a teaspoon, so I'm not very expressive. But when it comes to my advisor, um, she is very expressive. Um, and so we have this sort of different ranges of emotions that need to be sort of characterized. In essence, we have sort of this um, hierarchy uh, where there is a sense of what universal emotions are, but then there are some sub-global trends that need to be taken into account while you're modeling emotions. And so that is what we do in terms of uh, what we call an ID vector. So we use a speaker identification system uh, to extract uh, what we call ID vectors. And our assumption, our hypothesis is that these ID vectors in some dimension um, would bring together the speakers who have similar traits and states. Um, and then we use this ID vector as a feature representation uh, to our support vector regression model for valence activation and dominance uh, to predict the continuous um, um, emotions. Our second model is what we call a multimodal embedding network. Um, in this model, um, the idea is that instead of just using an acoustic representation, we are also using a text-based embedding. Um, and this comes from our, um, uh, from our uh, known knowledge about the world, which is that when people are frustrated, they tend to use words, certain words. Uh, and those words have some knowledge about the emotion. Uh, and so you can actually augment those along with the acoustic signal to make better predictions. <coughs> so it, this, in, this in turn uh, results in models that are able to beat the baselines, uh, as well as models that are able to generalize better. And this is, uh, we have seen this from our empiric empirical evidence. Um, what you see on the right is a demo of our system, uh, which, is, which will be open to public uh, by the end of next month. Um, a little orthogonal to this is the study of um, perception. So we said that yes, expressions are, um, expressions are, people uh, demonstrate expressions differently. But then there is also this, um, there, there is a line of studies uh, which says that people perceive emotions differently as well. So different genders have different ways of uh, perceiving emotions. And so, we use the data that we have, uh, which is the data in the wild, um, to study these emotions and come up with uh, novel statistical analysis uh, where we can make use of this noisy data but um, study perception. Uh, we've submitted a paper to uh, Sikkai and um, the decision for this is pending. In terms of future work, uh, we're looking at phonetic embeddings. Um, and so the idea here is that Along with the speaker uh, ID representation, we also want to embed the knowledge of what phonemes are being used. Um, and so um, this is actually not future work. Uh, this is done. Like when I actually put it on the slides, this was future work. Uh, but we have submitted a paper to ICASP just this morning. Um, and that is based on how phonemes, uh, how, uh, what are the phoneme bases for emotions. Um, and so that's all. Uh, I'd like to thank the amazing team, um, which includes myself. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask.
you know, and maybe this is a kind of a question that's maybe pulling some of this work towards uh, cybersecurity, but trust is regarded as an emotion in, uh, among psychologists. And I'm just curious where you think, you know, the emotion of trust falls within the VA, VAL or VAD model. Um, so um, I'll just repeat what I think the question is. So you're talking about a plot check wheel where there was, or you're just talking about trust um, as, as it is. Tr trust is, is kind of like a feeling that you have, you know, when you, it's a heuristic that is used to gauge whether you want to engage with somebody or not. It's, it's an emotion. And, you, and the VAD model that you described kind of represents emotions. Right. Um, so, so I was curious if there was a, a connection between that VAD model and the concept of trust. So uh, if, um, yes, uh, yeah, I get the question. So there is, um, so what you see on this blood check wheel, uh, I think there is trust somewhere there as well. Um, and so there is a direct representation, like I don't know the actual coordinates right now, uh, but I think um, it is there somewhere. Yes, trust is there, right? Um, so uh, this Plutchix wheels has a direct uh, correlation to the VAD model. Uh, it's just like you have to figure out uh, where that is uh, on the FX button. Yes. Yeah, um, I guess it's on, right? Great. Uh, so you have companies like Cogito, uh, Companion MX, or Spinout. How would you, who are all looking at detection of emotion over the phone for call centers and the like, you know, how do you get someone quickly through to the, uh, to the real person? Um, how would you compare their technologies to what you're doing here? Uh, what might be the distinctly uh, different aspects to it? I'm not uh, intimately, intimately familiar with what they're doing, but my understanding is that the, the current state of the art is looking only at broad scale voice features. So nothing uh, more nuanced than a spectrogram as the, the kind of uh, raw canvas that you're looking at. Uh, whereas we're trying to go uh, deeper and, and finer grain than that. Um, I'd like to add on that, uh, which is that, um, so we have actually uh, tried a lot of models from the literature and sort of from what we see from uh, our, our analysis is that a lot of those models also like, yes, they, on paper, they say, like, we have 67% accuracy, we have 50% accuracy over four or six emotions. But then when you put it in a real model, they're very, uh, it's, they don't work as well. That, that's what sort of, I think, triggered us to use the speaker-specific embeddings here as well. Um, and also, as Oren said, like, um, a lot of these models don't use continuous emotions. So they don't look at the nuances in the emotional states. Uh, and I think that is one of the novelties on how we actually use uh, the effect button to actually um, look at the continuous space. Um, 